Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. God is good. Anybody want to get in the Word of God tonight? Hallelujah. God is so good. Stand with me uh, if you have the ability. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer tonight. Invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, what a joy it is to be in your house, God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we rejoice that as we open up your word, God, that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, how wise you are, and Holy Spirit, how awesome you are that you can speak an individual word to every person in this room, God. Right where we're at, God, right in our situation. God, right in the midst of our lives, Lord, there you are, speaking to us, teaching us, guiding us, and directing us. Father, truly, we don't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color, God. We come to hear from you. So come, Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, and even the correction that we need for each and every one of our lives. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves also. We would ask it for all the churches tonight that are preaching the gospel, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. They are brothers and sisters, Lord, and we love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anyone else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in one field. That's yours, Lord, building one kingdom, and that's yours. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Go with me to the book of Joshua. Get out your Bible or your Bible app, whichever you prefer. Go with me to the book of Joshua. We're going to be in Joshua chapter number 20. Tonight I want to talk to you about a subject called God Our Refuge. On Sunday mornings we've been going through the book of Hebrews, and in the book of Hebrews there was a word that popped out to me one morning when I was getting ready to preach, and, and that word was just the word refuge, that we have fled to lay hold of the hope that was set before us. We've fled to, for refuge. And, and in that time of study, I found out some things that I wasn't able to fit into that weekend's message. And so I have, I've held them in my heart until tonight where we can dive into this and explore this more. Joshua chapter number 20, uh, God is setting up the nation of Israel. He's brought them out of the land of Egypt, and now they've crossed over. And God had given some instructions to Moses. Moses has passed on the law, passed on the work to Joshua. And now Joshua comes, and the Lord is speaking to Joshua, giving them victory. They're in, inheriting the land, inhabiting the land. They're taking possession of it. They've gone in with a conquest. And now here we are in Joshua chapter 20, and they're continuing the work that God had called them to do. There were some things that they needed to set up. They're divvying up the land. They're dividing it amongst the, the children of Israel, the different tribes. And now here in Joshua chapter number 20, something happens. The Lord's speaking to Joshua, and he says, verse number 2, Speak to the children of Israel saying, appoint for yourselves cities of refuge. Everybody say cities of refuge. Cities of, refuge. of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer, everybody say the slayer. the slayer. Now what he's talking about here is what he had already talked to Moses about in previous books of the Bible. And you'll find out that if somebody had accidentally killed somebody, they were a manslayer, not a murderer, they were a manslayer. It was accidental. There was no hate in their heart beforehand. It wasn't premeditated. So let's say they were chopping wood with somebody, and there they are with the axe, and they're chopping wood. And as they go back, the axe head comes off of their axe, and it flies, and it hits somebody in the head, and they end up dying from that wound. That was not premeditated. That was not on purpose. It was accidental. Now, the only problem with that when they had accidentally slain somebody was that there was something called the kinsman redeemer. There was the nearest relative, the closest relative to that person who died now would be called the avenger of blood. And so they would come after him. So they would, they would go after the slayer, okay? The person who accidentally committed murder or not a murderer, but somebody who was a manslayer. And it says that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there. So where are they fleeing? To the cities of refuge. And they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Now, there's that term that I just used, the avenger of blood. So here's the relative, here's the person who has the right to come and to kill the person that killed their relative. Remember, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It goes on in verse number four, and it says, And when he flees to one of these cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them. Everybody say them. Okay, they take that person into the city as one of them and give him a place that he may dwell among 
them. Now, who is the them? That's the people that live in the city. Interestingly enough, you will find that the cities of refuge in the Bible were all Levitical cities. What does that mean? The Levites, the, the sons of Levi, the children of Levi that came from his geo- genealogy, his descendants, these were the Levites. These cities were built and the Levites lived in these cities. So now the person who accidentally slays somebody goes to one of these cities of the Levites and he dwells with them. It's almost as if he becomes one of the children of Levi. By association, now this is his city, he's staying there in this city. This is now his town, this is now his place. Why is this important? Because the Levites were the priests, priests of Almighty God. So now here's a person who flees from the avenger of blood. They've accidentally committed murder, they've unintentionally killed somebody, and now they're fleeing for their life, they're running for their life, and they go to the city of refuge, and what do they do? They confess what happened. They say, I I accidentally killed somebody. They bring all the elders together, and they hear him out. What was going on? Well, I was swinging an axe, and the axe head fell, it flew off, and it hit my, my neighbor in the head, and he died right there, and so I gathered up my belongings, and I fled here now. They hear his case, and they say, okay, he now gets to stay with us, and he gets to live in that town. Very interesting. We're going to pull out some truth as we go along tonight. Continues on in verse number five. Then if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally but did not hate him beforehand. Verse six, and he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house. To the city from which he fled. Now, verse number seven and verse number eight, they name the cities. Now, I'm not going to read those just for time's sake tonight because we're going to talk about the names of the cities and find out what that means to our life. See, this would be an interesting study. It would be an interesting read. It'd be a, a great teaching time. And yet, how many of you know that the Word of God is not just a lesson? It's not just a history lesson. This is not just something contained in a book for thousands of years for us to go, hmm, that's interesting. And then we move on with our lives and it never really applies to us. See, if that was the case, we could wrap it up and go watch the Discovery Channel or the History Channel or something like that because they will pull out stuff all day long that you kind of wonder where they got it from, what it means, why is that important, that's a weird fact, that's interesting, and yet it never really applies. The difference here is that as we approach the Word of God, the Word of God speaks. Everything speaks. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees of his days, and he says, why do you guys search the Scriptures when they're talking about me? So as we take a look in the Word of God, we find out that these scriptures, these were the scriptures that Jesus was talking about, the Old Testament. They didn't have the Gospels. They didn't have the New Testament at that time. Why? Because they hadn't been written yet. And so now here Jesus is, and he's saying, you guys search the scriptures. You guys read the history. You guys read the prophets. You guys read the law. You guys read the poetical books of the Bible, and you guys study them, and you search them out, and yet they're all pointing to me. So we need to make it our aim and our goal to find Jesus in his word, that we go to him and that we see him and see what it is that he's doing. What is it that he's saying? We see from these cities of refuge that God has provided for us a refuge in Christ. Now, I should have had a great big amen on that. See, God has provided for us a refuge in Christ. See, we had all unintentionally slain somebody. You say, I never killed anybody. Yes, we did. Our sin is what nailed Jesus to the cross. See, we didn't know that we were doing it. We may have been rebellious. We may have known what we were doing. We may have knew that we were doing the wrong thing when we did that wrong thing, but we didn't realize the implications of what it was that our life was doing. Our sin had a price, and the price was the death of Jesus. Why? Because God took that on himself rather than pouring out his wrath on us. Why? Because God is the avenger of blood. God is the righteous judge. God is the one who repays. That's why the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Now, I know there's a lot of bad teaching out there right now about the wrath of God, and there is no more wrath of God and all that kind of stuff. But my Bible says that the wrath of God is being stored up for the sons of disobedience. That's in the New Testament. And the Bible says that the children of the devil, that the wrath of God will be poured out on them. But see... We, unintentionally, not knowing what we were doing when we were sinning, not realizing that that was the very sin that Jesus decided to take on himself and go to the cross and that Jesus died on behalf of us for our sin, we didn't realize what we had done. 
And yet now, once we realize we no longer flee from God, who is the avenger of blood, no, we flee to Jesus, who is our city of refuge. Are you listening tonight? That's why this is important. These six cities were spread throughout Israel and were spread from the top, middle, and bottom. If you take a look at the map, there were six cities. Two at the top, two in the middle, two at the bottom. East to west, they covered everywhere. They were uh, well-maintained roads that went to these cities. These cities were in open places. One of them was in a plain, right in the middle of the plain. That way, everybody could see it from miles around. They had markings. They had signposts that said, this is the way to the city. A lot of these cities were up on a hill or in a mountainous area so that you could see the city from a distance. None of these cities was more than a half day's journey to the city. It would not be an overnight long journey. It was a half day so that they could get there quickly. What is this saying to us? It's saying that the gospel, that Jesus Christ is more than enough for everyone. Saying that Jesus has spread his arms wide and now he welcomes us in to his family. Now he welcomes us in to this city of refuge. Now we can come to Jesus with our sin. We can come to Jesus with our lives, with our brokenness, with all that we are, all that we've ever done, all of our past. And we can come to Jesus and now we can confess our wrong to him. We can declare our case before the righteous judge and we can say, I'm guilty, I am a sinner, and I am in need of refuge. And now Jesus hears our case and he says, I've provided something for you. i provided refuge. And as we come under the blood of Jesus Christ, we get welcomed into that city. And now, remember, it was the Levitical cities, right? They were the priesthood in Israel at that time. Now, as we are welcomed in into the family of God, we become a part of that family. Now we get to have a place in that family. Now all of a sudden, we become, the Bible says, kings and priests. Why is that? Because Jesus is a king, and he's not ashamed to call us his brethren, and he has made us kings and priests here on the earth. That was God's original desire for Israel, is that they should be his special people, his holy people, a nation of priests. And now the Bible says that we have been made kings and priests before Almighty God. See, when you enter into that city, you didn't even realize it, but your life is transformed, never to be the same again. And I want you to notice something else that says that, that until the day that their case can come up before the congregation, that they had to stay in that city until the death of the high priest. Until the death of the high priest, and then they could return to their home, and then the, they would, their case would be heard before the congregation. See, our priest, our high priest now, Jesus Christ, because he has the power of an unending life. He lives forever. And now we can go to Jesus, and now he has an unchangeable priesthood, the Bible tells us. And now here Jesus is king and priest. He is our high priest forever. And now we can live with him forever because he's never going to die. He's never going to pass away. We always have a refuge in Christ Jesus. Are you listening tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. His judgment is righteous when we make our confession. He's accessible to us and near to all of us for salvation and help presently. Now, tonight, I want to take a look at the names of the cities, because as we take a look at the names of the cities, we're going to find out some things about Jesus, find out about God, our refuge. And as we take a look at these things, I want you to just note them in your heart. Maybe if you're taking notes tonight, you can jot these things down. Not, not so much so that you'll know the name of the city and what that means and all that kind of stuff. That's for, for the, the geeks like me who like that kind of stuff, and that's cool for, for those of you that like that. But really, I want you to get a hold of the heart behind it. Because, see, as we come to God, there are so many things that come with God. Everything that, that is God, everything that God does, everything that God uh, is, is involved in, when you come to God, you can now partake, the Bible says, of the divine nature of God. So as we enter into that city, as we enter into God, our refuge, Jesus Christ the righteous, now all of a sudden with him comes all these things. And so I want to take a look at the names of these cities, and we'll find that God is a refuge in many ways. First name of the city was Kadesh. We find this city called Kadesh. Kadesh meaning holy or holiness. Now, the way that we define holiness here at the rock is exclusively his. In other words, we are no one else. We are undivided. Now we are exclusively his. And the Bible says that God is the holy one. Jesus was the holy one of Israel. And that, what does that mean? That means he's exclusively ours. So when we take a look at Kadesh or the, the holiness, this was an exclusive place of refuge. Part of the terms for the manslayer who fled to these cities for refuge was that in order for them to stay in that city and be safe from the avenger of blood was that they had to stay inside the city. 
In other words, if they were in the city and they got bored and they decided, you know what, I'm going to go outside and just take a hike or something. You know, we're here in the mountains. It's beautiful all around us. I just want to go out there and see what's going on. The moment they step foot outside of the gates of the city, if the avenger of blood found them outside of there, they could kill them. And they would be righteous in doing so. Why? Because they violated the terms that God had set forth. In other words, in order to stay holy, exclusively his, and in order to stay with God being exclusively theirs, there's a term that comes along with that. What is that term? That term is obedience. See, in our lives, we need to stay obedient to the call of being holy because the Bible tells us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And that we were not called to uncleanness, but we were called to holiness. So the very first thing is, if we're going to flee to God for refuge, we need to flee to him and exclusively to him. What does that mean? That means that when you're in a time and you're coming to God, that you don't come to anyone else, that you haven't come to a self-help. This is not about you helping yourself. You haven't come to someone else saving you. That's not going to work. You can't get in there on someone else's merit or your family's merit. No, you have to come to God exclusively alone to the one true God, to the one Savior, and now he is exclusively yours and you are exclusively his and you are holy unto the Lord. It means that you're obedient and that you agree to his terms. See, we can't come to God on our own terms. Can't come to God our own way. We have to come on his terms, his way. The Bible says that it's a highway of holiness. Turn me to the book of Isaiah. You're there in Joshua. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Right there past the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. You'll find Isaiah, big book, Isaiah chapter 35. And in Isaiah chapter 35, I want to take a look at a great verse. Remember we said that there was a road that was well marked that led to the cities of refuge. Isaiah chapter 35, verse number 8 says this. Isaiah chapter 35, verse number 8 says this. It says, a highway shall be there and a road. And it shall be called the highway of holiness. Isn't that awesome? Now look at this. The unclean shall not pass over it. Isn't that amazing? Well, who can go on it? Well, let's take a look at the rest of the verse. But look at this. It shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, and I love this part, although a fool shall not go astray. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, not many of you were wise when you were called. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were anything that the world would take a look at and give any attention to. He says, but now... Christ has become our wisdom. And see, when we do God's will, God's way, when we walk that highway of holiness, even though in the natural we may be fools, the Bible says that we shall not go astray. I had a good friend, a lot of you guys know him. His name was Martin. Little guy, little black guy. He's my brother. My goodness, I just loved Martin. Martin loved everyone, all the same. He knew everybody's name. He walked around here. You would have thought he was the pastor of the church the way he walked around here sometimes. You know, he had his head back and shoulders back, and he was all of this tall. I mean, a corn rose on his head from a certain period of time, big gold tooth in the front. The guy was awesome. I had the privilege after Martin passed away and went to be the, with the Lord of doing the memorial service for Martin. And during that service, we played a video of my friend Martin, and he was there preaching a message to us. And it was amazing how he recounted his past and how he talked about how he had just been into the wrong thing on earth. He knew better. And he had ended up overdosing on drugs. He went into the hospital, and he says that he died and had an encounter with Jesus. And during that time that, that he changed over, he crossed over, and he says, I left this world a fool, and I came back a preacher. Isn't that amazing? Listen to the words. I left this world a fool, but I came back a preacher. See, Martin was in church every time the doors were open. He was here every time opportunity that he could get. He was involved in everything that we did. When somebody got saved, it didn't matter where they were all over the sanctuary. Martin was walking over there. He may have been posted on that side, but somebody raised their hand over there and they weren't walking forward and Martin was going to go get them. He would walk all the way across the sanctuary. He would grab them. I remember one time he had two children in his hands and he was just walking them forward slowly, just laughing and rejoicing and crying. What happened to him? He had an encounter with Almighty God. He fled to God for his refuge. He may have been a fool, but he walked on the road. And although a fool, he didn't go astray. And he's in heaven now today. Isn't that awesome? 
Now, that was my friend Martin, but let's learn the lesson for our lives. Because we can be pretty foolish at times. I know, I know I can be pretty foolish at times. Hello? And although we may be a fool, if we just do God's will, God's way, maybe we weren't influential, maybe we weren't businessmen and women, maybe we don't have the education or the smarts or the background, didn't have the family connections, didn't have the business connections, we couldn't make it happen on our own. But as you do it God's way, whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. That's the highway of holiness. Okay, we got to go. We got to go because there's five more tonight. Wow. Maybe we'll get through two more and then we'll do it another time. Okay, we'll see how many we can go. Second one was Shechem. Shechem. Or like uh, if you want to say it in Hebrew, Shechem, all right? You, you got to get a little, little in there. So Now Shechem meant shoulder. Say what? Shoulder. Yeah, like this right here. Shoulder. You say, well, I understand holiness. That's an easy one. But what does it mean if I flee for refuge to a shoulder? Well, how about this? A refuge from burdens. See, where does a burden go? When you pick up, maybe you have a sack of something, right? There's, there's a big burden that you're going to carry. Where are you going to put that on? You're going to pick that thing up, and are you going to carry it down here? No, why? Because that's going to hurt your back. So what do you do? You lift it up over your shoulder, and you carry that burden that way. See, when you flee to God, you can bring him your life, you can bring him your burdens, you can bring him your worries. Why? Because Jesus Christ is your refuge. And the Bible says the government is on his shoulders. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, right? The government is on his shoulders. If Jesus can carry the weight of the world and the government systems which we all know how much government frustrates us, right? And we're not even involved in it. Some of you are, but man, for those of us that are just watching the news and stuff like that, we can get frustrated. If Jesus can handle all that, how much more can Jesus shoulder your burden? How much more can Jesus carry the weight of your family? How much more can Jesus take on the weight of your situation, your finances, your health, your job, your security, your issues, your past, your doubts, your fears, your unbeliefs, whatever it is, you bring that burden to Jesus and you flee to him for refuge and Jesus will shoulder the burden for you. Isn't that awesome? Very familiar verses in Matthew chapter 11. Go there with me. I want you to see this in your Bible in case you... Don't know these verses. Matthew chapter 11. Great verses to memorize, to look at, to think about throughout the week. If you're burdened, I want you to get, get a hold of a pencil or a pen and circle these verses in your Bible. Make sure to be able to get back to them. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse number 28. Look at what Jesus says. Come to me. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Right off the bat, what does he say? Flee. Run to lay hold of this refuge. Come to me. Who should come? Look at this. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now look at what he says in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. What is a yoke? A yoke was an instrument that they would yoke two oxen together. They, that was the term, yoke them together, right? And they would take this thing, and it had like two U-shapes, okay? Almost like horseshoes, big horseshoes. And they would put those over the necks of two oxen. And those two oxen together would have a plow behind them that they would pull together. So Jesus says, link up with me. Come to me, you who are burdened. Come to me, you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. See, in you taking his yoke upon you, you know what else is happening? He's taking your yoke upon him. Wow. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why is that? Because Jesus has taken the brunt of the weight. Because he's the greater one within us. And if God be for us, then who can be against us? If God is on our side, what can man do to us? And the Lord says, listen, I take care of the sparrows. I take care of the birds. I clothe the flowers. How much more value are, are you to me? See, we get so weighed down with the cares of this life. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to pay the bill. I don't know what I'm going to do with the family. I don't know what I'm going to do with these kids. I don't know what I'm going to do with that husband or that wife. Or I don't know what I'm going to do with my boss. And pressure's on there. You're handing out pink slips. There's going to be another roll of layoffs. I don't have enough seniority. I don't have any smarts. I don't have an education. I've only done this job my whole life, and I don't think I'm experienced for anything else. 
We can provide every excuse. We can go through everything. We can ball and squall. And yet God is saying, don't carry that burden yourself. Bring it to me and I will take it upon myself. But you've got to take my yoke upon you. But it's easy and it's light. Why? Because he's the greater one. He can handle it. He can handle your issues. Jesus is the greater one. You can flee to him for refuge. Here's another one. Hebron. Hebron. Okay, uh, you'll see in the Bible, for those of you scholars out there, Kirjath Arba, which is also called Hebron. Hebron meaning a fellowship, right? This, this talked about relationship. This talked about closeness. In other words, this was a welcome refuge. See, before you were outcasts, you were aliens. You weren't a part of that community. But now when you flee to that city for refuge, when you come to Jesus, you become a part of the family of God. Now, maybe you've never been told this, but you're welcome. You're awesome. Jesus loves you, and we love you. You now have fellowship in this place. This is not just a church filled with people. This is the family of God. And even beyond that, this is the body of Christ. We're connected to one another, and we need one another. Isn't that amazing? See, God knew what he was doing when he put the word together. And now he says, I want you to come to me for a welcome refuge. We now can have fellowship with God. See, before, in the Old Covenant, you couldn't come to God by yourself. You had to go through the high priest. And only the high priest could come into the presence of God once a year and not without blood. Well, now that the blood of Jesus has been shed and now we are welcomed in, now, by his grace, we are given an entrance. The king has called for you. He is not just the king. He's also your father now. And now you can enter into the presence of God Almighty yourself each and every day, every moment of your life. You can live in his presence. Can I put it to you like this? There is a seat at the table with your name on it. And you are not only given right to it, you're wanted there. God wants you in his family. God wants you at his table. God wants to see your face. God wants to hear your voice. God wants to fellowship. He wants to commune with you. He wants a deep, intimate relationship. My goodness, we've all been to parties in different places where we felt like we were alone in a crowd of people. Even in our own families, we felt that way. We felt like outcasts. We've had people turn their backs on us. But now you have fled to Jesus for refuge. And you have become a part of the family. Now you've been welcomed in and been given entrance. Red carpet's been rolled out for you. Paparazzi's there taking pictures of you. People are following you on Facebook. They're becoming your Twitter followers. They're, they're, they're coming after you. They're stalking you. Why? Because God is so in love with you that he gave his life to be with you. And now you have been given entrance to Almighty God. You have been given fellowship. Isn't that amazing? Now we're a part of the family. And let's not confuse something. When I, in my study time, I, I had this, this phrase come into my head, and I just want to share this with you. Ministry and busyness are no substitute for a real relationship with Jesus. And I am preaching to the choir right now. Okay, That, that was for me personally, but I wanted to share that with you as well. Because sometimes we come into the house of God, and, and while I love all of our volunteers and everybody, I don't want you to be so busy that you miss out on Jesus. I don't want you to be so busy that you never sit in a church service. I don't want you to be ministering and, and, and doing multiple times. And I know you guys are here on a Wednesday night, but my goodness, let's never substitute our ministry or our busyness for the Lord for a real relationship with the Lord. Okay? Thank you for those several week claps. <laughs> Praise God. Now you don't have to. God's good. See, God wants a real relationship. One of, the, one of the things that we all should strive to do is to wake up every morning and have God be the first thing on our mind. God be the first confession out of our mouth. Jesus be the first name on our lips. See, I'm not even awake until I take a shower. In the middle of my shower, I wake up, and that's where I pray. Because, you know, I kind of do the zombie walk over there and get in the shower, and that's, that's the first place I'm cognizant. That's the first place I realize that there's something going on, you know. And, and so there in the shower, I pray. Every night before bed, you can ask my wife. I'm in the Word, reading the Bible making sure that it, God is the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. And see, we can never substitute a real, fresh relationship with God for our busyness for the Lord 
or with God. Now, that doesn't mean don't volunteer. That's something you can do with God, too. Bring, hey, God, we're going to volunteer. I'm going to do this in your strength. God, what do you think about this? God, how do I respond to this? God, what can I do to make this better? See, those are all awesome things, but never substitute that for your relationship with God. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We're doing good on time. Doing good. Revelation chapter 21. Anybody enjoying this so far? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Praise God. It doesn't matter if you didn't like it. I'd preach it anyways. That's all I got. <laughs> Revelation chapter 21, verse number 3. Great verse. Great verse. I love reading the last couple chapters of Revelation because it just shows you what it's going to be like forever and ever into eternity. Revelation chapter 21, verse number 3. Take a look at it with me. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven. I love that. Heaven's going to be loud. I love loud. We were sitting at the dinner table last night, it was loud, and we were like, oh my goodness, it's getting loud up in here, it was the children. See, the children of God, it's going to be a, a loud voice because all the children are going to be there. And a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God. Hold on right a second. Hold on. Wait a second. Wait a second. See, we hear tabernacle and we think about the Old Testament tabernacle. You know what the tabernacle really is? It's the dwelling place of God. See, because... The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and tabernacled, literally is the translation, among us. So in other words, the dwelling place of God. Okay, so a loud voice came out of heaven and says, Behold, look and see, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, what? Is with who? Men. God wants to be with us. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, God himself will be with them and be their God. God never wanted you in heaven apart from him. That's what this is all about for eternity, is us getting to be with our King Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's what it's all about. Okay, here's another one. After that is Bezer. Bezer meaning a stronghold or a mighty fortress. This is a strong refuge. See, the shoulder, you remember, was the strength for the burden. Now, this stronghold is a strength against outside attack. See, because not only did we flee from the avenger of blood, remember, we, we are now covered by the blood of Jesus. And now no longer is God our enemy. Now God is our friend. He is now our close relative. We are part of the family of God. But that does not stop us from the attacks of the enemy. And there is a devil out there and I know the world is trying to mask him and trying to say he's friendly, you know. But this is not Casper. This is the real devil. He hates your guts. He doesn't want you to be with God forever. He wants you to go down to the pit with him. He knows his end, and he's trying to drag us down with him. And there is a real enemy of our soul. And rather than ignore him and let him beat the junk out of us day to day, we need to run to God for refuge. Why? Because God is our stronghold. And the Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower that the righteous run into and they are safe. And anytime you encounter that devil, you speak that name of Jesus. The Bible says submit to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee. There in Revelation, turn back with me to the Psalms. Psalms chapter 46. Great verse in Psalms chapter number 46. Psalms chapter 46. In fact, you could re read the whole psalm when you have some time this week. It's a great psalm. Psalms chapter number 46. Verse number 1. Look at this confession right off the beginning. Psalms chapter 46 verse 1. It says this. It says, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help. In trouble. Now it goes on to say, therefore we will not fear. Continues on. And like I said, you can read through that. But I want you to just zero in on that first part. Right there, I've highlighted up on the overhead. God is our refuge. See, when you run to God, these are the stronghold. God is our refuge. But he not only is our refuge, he's our strength. You can handle the attack on your life. You can overcome the temptations. You can overcome the trials. Why? Because he is a very present help in trouble. The Bible says, let us enter into the presence of God that we can go into the throne room and we can find grace to help in a time of need. God is right there with you in the midst of your trial. It doesn't matter if all hell breaks loose against you. It doesn't matter what happens. God is there in the midst of your trial. And if you've got God on your side, who cares what's going on? 
He is your refuge and strength. He is your very present help in time of trouble. Next one is Ramath. Ramath. What is Ramath? Well, it's exaltation. This is an uplifting refuge. See, salvation takes us from the low life to the high life. See, before we, we, we were sinners. We were out there doing our thing. We know the kind of stuff we were into. And now we've been delivered from that. We have fled for refuge to Jesus. We've laid hold of that refuge and that hope. And now Jesus takes us from being a low lifer to being a high lifer. What does the Bible say? It says, humble yourselves under the hand of God, that in due time he will lift you up. He will exalt you. God takes us from here, and he takes us up here. Why? Because that's where God is. God wants us to come up. God wants us to go up. He doesn't want us to stay in sin, in sickness, in death, in that old way, in that filth. No, God wants us to come up to his way. Remember, it's a highway of holiness. And so God says, as you come to me, I will exalt you. As you find refuge in me, I will lift you up. The Bible says, thou, O Lord, are the lifter of my head. See, maybe you've been going through some tough times, and you found your shoulders have started to slump over and now all of a sudden your head has started to drop and you no longer can see up but now all you see is your situation right here in front of you well listen saints run to jesus lay hold of jesus get into that city of refuge and find that hope find that exaltation find your strength in god and god himself the bible says will wipe away every tear and he will lift up your head now all of a sudden you can look up and you can see around and you can see hey god has brought me up See, we all can look to our past. Anybody who's been in the things of God for a while can look at where they've come from and see where God has brought them to. Isn't it an upward progress? Hasn't God taken you from here, and then you went here, and then you went here, and then you went here, and now here you are way up here. But see, in the middle of the journey, you think, my goodness, I don't, I don't feel like I'm going up. See, it's a gradual thing. God grows us, and he takes us from glory to glory. God takes us from one image to another image. God takes us up. Because that's the direction we're headed. You there in Psalms 46, turn with me. Very familiar Psalm, Psalm chapter number 91. You had to know we were going there tonight. Psalms 91. While you're turning there, I'm going to put verse 2 up on the overhead, but I'll start reading in verse number 1 while you're turning to Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is getting into the very presence of God. Verse number 2, look at this. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take what? Refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. We know what the shield is, right? But the buckler was the little shield on the back too. See, God has you covered front to back, left to right, top to bottom. God's got the north, south, east, and west. God knows the direction. God knows the plan. God's got it all covered. See, when you come to Jesus, now all of a sudden you can say, God's got my back. But also, God's got my front. God's got my left. God's got my right. Doesn't matter what's going on around me. God's got me covered. Now take a look down at verse Number 14, it goes on, and, and my goodness, you, you can just read through this one too. So, okay, your homework assignment, read Psalm 91 as well, all right? But look at this. God responds at the end of this psalm. God starts to speak and starts to say something. And oftentimes we think of this in terms of Jesus because it does apply to Jesus. But remember, now you fled to Jesus for refuge and you are in Christ Jesus. And, you know, the best prayer, the best prayer is not a monologue, just us talking to God. The best prayer is a dialogue where God is talking to us and we hear his voice. Listen to the voice of God. Psalms 91, verse number 14. Look at this. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him down low. Set him in the gutter. Set him down there over in the corner. You guys, come on. Hello. It's up there on the overhead in case you, you were wondering about what I'm asking for, okay? Let's try that again. I will set him where? On high. on high. That's the exalted position. God takes us from that low place because we've set our love on him. He will deliver us and he will set us on high because he has known my name, that refuge in Jesus. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. Last city of refuge. Golan or Golan. What is that joy? 
joy, rejoicing. This is a joyful refuge. See, all of this wrapped up together, everything that we've covered so far, when you take a look at all of that, you can't help but be happy. You can't help but smile. You can't help but rejoice. Right there in the middle of your trial, you can say, well, God's my strength. It doesn't matter what's coming against me. Right there in the middle of your burden, you can say, well, God's got the bigger shoulders. And and you know what? I've yoked up with Jesus now, and now I don't have to carry that weight anymore. His burden is easy, and his yoke is light. I can handle it. I can face another day. I don't have to worry about sin and that stain back there. No, now I'm walking on the highway of holiness. See, and when you take a look at all that, it doesn't matter the outlook. What matters is, is that you've got Jesus on the inside, and therefore you've got joy. My goodness, we should be the most excited, most happiest, most wonderfully expressive, joyful people on the planet. Listen, I will give Disneyland that they are the happiest place on earth. That's fine. You can have that. You can handle that for the three seconds that you're actually on the ride, that people are really happy and having fun. And then the rest of the time we know the truth, that they're standing in line cursing the fact that they spent all that money to stand in that line. Right? So yeah, we'll give that to you. But the church doesn't care about happiness, which is based on circumstances and temporary things. No, we are the most joyful people here on earth and into eternity. Because God is our refuge. Last verse for tonight. Last verse for tonight. Deuteronomy. Fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy right before Joshua. is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 33. Some great verses here. We'll conclude with this tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse number 27 through verse number 29. Deuteronomy chapter 33, starting in verse number 27, says this. Look at this. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. I love that. The everlasting arms. Can you just imagine God just wrapping his arms around you? Just pulling you close, holding you tight. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. Verse 28, then Israel shall dwell in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone, in the land of grain and new wine. His heaven shall also drop dew. Now, can I just tell you what that just said? Okay, because we don't speak in terms like that. We don't talk about grain and new wine and heaven's dropping dew. But really what he's talking about is provision. He's talking about blessing. And he's talking about the faithfulness of Almighty God coming through in the right time, in the right season. That's really what he just talked about, okay? Is that there is an abundant provision with God. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fear. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to be frustrated. God has the supply for your need. God knows what it is in your life. He knows your position. God's got it all covered. And in season, his heaven shall also drop dew. God will pour out the blessing right in the right time, in the right way, in the right place. God's got your number. He knows where to send it. And he will come through in the right time. Now, how do you feel when you know about that? Good. Let's read the next verse. Let's read the next verse. The heavens shall drop to you. Verse 29. First word. Happy. Happy. I'm sorry. First word. Say it with a smile. Happy. See, that was better that second time. There you go. Happy. Happy are you, O Israel. Who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? There's nobody else saved by the Lord. Only the true Israel. Only the ones who have run to Jesus for refuge. We are the only one who have a reason to rejoice. Happy are you, O Israel. Who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? The shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tread down their high places. Devil, we're coming. Hallelujah. In Christ, we have holiness. In Christ, we have rest. In Christ, we have fellowship. In Christ, we have safety. In Christ, we have exaltation. And in Christ, we have joy. Come on, if you got joy in Christ, give God a great big praise tonight. Hallelujah. I want to thank you guys for staying put. I want to thank you guys also uh, just for your enthusiasm. My goodness, I I could tell you really received from the word. And isn't it awesome that we can go to something like the cities of refuge in the Old Testament, pull out such truths that it changes our lives. God's good to us. Truly God's spoken to us. Let's make sure before you leave that 
you truly are in Christ Jesus. It would be a shame for us to talk about everything we talked about tonight and not give you the opportunity to get right with God. Because the Bible says if you're not right with God, that the wrath of God still rests on you. It's being stored up. Now, as Americans, we don't like that thought. We think of God as, you know, this loving, he's going to let anybody into heaven, you know, and, uh, and, and he doesn't really care how you get there as long as you stay true to yourself. That's been a lie that's been fed to us. We've been told that hell is not a real place and, you know, that's just a figment of everybody's imagination and yet everybody wants to go to heaven. But they don't say that's a figment of our imagination. They want that, but they don't want to face the reality of hell. Tonight, I want you to take a look in your heart. See where you're at with God. I want you to think about this question. If you were to die tonight, where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Now, if you're saying, Pastor, I believe all roads lead to heaven, you know that nowhere in the Bible say all roads lead to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does say that we can get there however we want to get there. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You're not going to make it. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You'll never make it. In the same way, just doing whatever we want to do is not going to get us to heaven. Just like those people that fled to the cities of refuge, they had to follow a certain path. They had to go on a certain road to get there. And it was well marked. And they were told about it. See, tonight, I'm nothing more than a road post pointing you to Jesus. This is the way. And yet people don't like that. We want to do our way. But listen, you can't get to heaven our way. Can't get to heaven your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Don't you think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption and carried it out in his son Jesus, don't you think he'd tell us how to get there? Well, he does in his word. Now, sometimes people think that, you know, well, pastor, I, I know that God lets good people into heaven, and I've been really good. You know, I used to be bad, clean up my act, now I'm good, and, you know, I think I'm going to get to heaven because I'm, I'm really a nice person, nice to my neighbors, give money to charities, you know, buy water that digs wells in Africa, and buy shoes that put, put shoes on other people uh, all over the world, and, and, and that's really my goodness, and I, I'm really helping out, and I'm giving back, and that sort of a thing, paying it forward. And while that's great, and I, I, I'm glad that you're doing those things, could you show me how that gets into heaven from the Bible? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say we can be good enough. Nor in the Bible does it say that because of our good works that God sees that and counts them up and that if our good outweighs our bad or if we're good enough, we get to heaven. You know why? Because we can't be good enough. The standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Just like we talked about unwittingly, we didn't even know we were doing it. And yet it was our sin that died for. He died. Tonight, come on, listen up. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Sometimes people say, well, I'd go to heaven because, you know, I was raised in church. Parents told me you were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Took you to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism class. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not a Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you in the category of being a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're born in America, wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, or because your parents take you to church, that that makes you a Christian. You're not going to make it. And I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. Some of you might be saying, but wait a second, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church right now, right here in front of you, Pastor. It's great, I'm glad you're here, but show that to me in the Bible where sitting in church gets you into heaven. It's like saying you can sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Mm -mm. You can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Some of you might be thinking, well, I get that, Pastor, but you know, my last church I got involved, I helped out, carried the Pastor Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader and you get to go to heaven. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible. And yet, many of us, many people think that because they got involved in church, helped out, did things in the church, that they're going to get to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible to say God's looking for your membership card before you can enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Good guy. Did a lot of good deeds. He was a teacher in Israel. Great man in Israel. He, he held to the strictest form of the law, the religious law of his time. People looked up to him to find out about God. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He could debate the scripture. 
He knew who God was. And yet that wasn't enough. Why? Because my Bible says the demons believe that Jesus Christ is in God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is, and that doesn't make him a Christian. And in the same way, this religious leader, Nicodemus, he knew who Jesus was, and yet that didn't qualify him for heaven. He didn't meet up with Jesus, and Jesus said, oh, you know me. Hey, cool, great, I'll see you in heaven. It doesn't work like that. What does he say? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, again, our society has made a mockery out of that. We don't like that. We see it as weird or crazy or whatever. And yet this is not about what society or Hollywood or books or movies or television say. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean for the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the th same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. Remember, we said they had to flee and lay hold of that refuge. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life. If not, then I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. This is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that? Well, it's a little in, little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. You're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. Hold on. Time out. Time out. Let me get this straight. You're going to point at me and count? I might be embarrassed. Mm-hmm. You might be. Let's get over that tonight. Listen, we've all done this at one point or another. We've all said yes to Jesus at one time in our life. We're rooting for you. Listen, the people that invited you tonight... They wanted you to do this. They're excited for you. No one's judging. No one's criticizing. No one's condemning. We're excited and we're going to be happy for you. But even if you are embarrassed, it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. No one would make that trade. Come on tonight. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Done my job. I loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's already done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross for us. Now it's our turn. If you need to do this tonight, will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus? Give them all of your heart and all of your life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, if you look warm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God in a moment by acknowledging your need for Jesus raising your hand. Back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe or online around the world, come on, let's get ready to get your hand up. God sees and God's watching. Wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. There's one. There's two. God bless you guys. There's three. Who else tonight? There's four. Got you over there. Where else are you at? Four wise people already. Four wise people already. Right over here, five got you right there. Thank you. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Five, I got you guys. Thank you. You can put your hands down, both of you. Thank you so much. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? We got five wise people already. Come on, if that's you, you need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. I'm speaking to you tonight. You know that God's talking at your heart. Thank you. There's two more up there. There's seven. Thank you. God bless you guys. Who else? You're saying, yeah, I need to do this. Come on, you're, you're running to Jesus. Flee into Jesus for refuge like we talked about your salvation. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Anybody back in the family rooms or the foyer? Real quick. Where are you at? Where are you at? Thank you, number eight. God bless you. Anybody else tonight? Come on, number nine and number 10. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Thank you, number nine. All right, cool. Who else? Who else? Number 10, come on. Come on. We're all waiting for you and we love you. We're excited for you. God loves you. Who else? Where are you at, number 10? Come on. When I'm looking in your direction, is that a hand over there? No, scratching the head? Okay, cool. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. Got nine wise people. Number 10. Number 10. 
Come on, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Who else tonight? Where you at? Where you at? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this up, number 10. Don't miss this. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. One last sweep, and then we're going to close it up, okay? So come on, if that's you, wherever you're at, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Who else tonight? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for nine wise people. Hallelujah. All right, all nine of you that raised your hand or number 10, you rascal, you should have raised your hand, but you did not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. We're going to sing a song. As we do that, get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Meet us up front. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I believe. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Hey, everybody up front. Thank God you guys have come. So excited for you guys. You can put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, okay? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, this guy right here, he's about the weirdest you're going to encounter tonight. He's cool. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, it's a one-on-one thing where you get to meet up with somebody. Remember, we talked about fellowship. You're now welcomed into the family of God, okay? And we want to encourage you in your walk with God. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. Now, listen, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year, one year of your life here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, sitting under the teaching of the Word of God consistently, okay? We have 11 church services a week. That's a lot of opportunities to get the Word. So as much as you can, Get in and sit under that teaching. And at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you'll say these words. I am so blessed. I didn't know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. Take their word for it, okay? You guys can make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel. Let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again, I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.